So what is the topic you're going to bring today? This is kind of a big one. The hard question of consciousness. The biggest question really in, in history, in science, it, it's a real challenge. How, the question is, we know consciousness exists because it's our whole, everything we experience, we experience by being conscious of it. Everything that we don't experience, we're not conscious of. So it's, it's, it's the totality of everything in science. We, science is like a, a branch of consciousness. It's a description of our consciousness of matter and energy and the cosmos and psychology reflecting on itself. But yet, how does consciousness emerge from this material world that we're conscious of? And that's it's called the hard question of consciousness. It's why we have, since Descartes, this duality of we have the body over here and we have the, the mind and the spirit over here. We have the church, we have the state. We don't have a unified governance of, of life because we don't understand the how it's one. We, we kind of, we know, it, the philosophers know it's one or, or not, but I'm going to attempt to describe how I see the link between the experience and the material form that gives rise to that experience. So, well, starting... Before yeah. that, could you, could you even say what the difference is between energy and consciousness versus energy contained in consciousness? I'm going to address that first. The, from, a, from a cosmic perspective, if you look at the biggest picture of, of what is, of what we can imagine is, in, in, in current science, there's five things. We can call it a quintessence. And it's an old term from ancient Greece of five things. The, they're different things than the Greeks contemplated, but yet there's the same five things, five, five, the pattern of five. And we see the same in Oriental thinking. They came up with a duality understanding of yin and yang and Taoism, and then, and then it grew into an understanding of, of, of five, a symmetry of five, a five-fold mm -hmm. rotation of, of the five elements. And, and that all folds in, it all fits into this model very nicely. So the five things now in physics would be essentially on a, on, you know, a, a, a common term, common language sense, we have protons that make up matter. So we have material form of, of minerals that have protons in their nucleus and make up that hard stuff that seems to be hard. And the closer we look at it, the more we see it's just all standing waves of energy. It's, it's all energy. But yet there's this matter made of protons and, and neutrons. There's electrons. They're different. And an atom is made up of the two of those. Right? The proton in the center, we have the basic atom would be hydrogen. Most of the atoms in the universe are hydrogen atoms. They have one proton and one electron. And then we have photons, light. And the light interacts with the electron, especially. The electron can go into different orbitals when it absorbs or emits light. And so we have the proton, the electron, and the photon. So we had those, that trinity until just a couple of years ago, and now trying to figure out how the matter out there in the cosmos works, they're saying, well, but there seems to be a couple other things going on, so we're going to call that, and it seems to be most of what's going on by the amount of energy of it, and that's, because all these things are energy forms, but the five different types of energy, protons, electrons, photons, and dark matter, and dark energy, they're calling it dark, because we don't see it, but we can calculate it must be there, there's something there, there's some function there. And so we have a quintessence, a five-fold symmetry that the symmetry shows up when we measure how much there is of each of these things. It's not, it's not symmetrical, it's not balanced and harmonic in terms of the amount of energy. There's, most of it's the dark energy, right? And most of the rest is the dark matter. All the stuff that we don't see, sort of the, the spirit. It's mostly spirit. And a little bit is kind of like you look at the cosmos. Here's Here's the galactic plane, and there's a few stars, and it's mostly space, and space above and space below. There's this one little plane where there's this stuff going on. Well, now you're using the word spirit. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that, that is exactly the same question. What's consciousness? What's spirit? So, so I'm modeling it that all these are conscious. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is, in a sense, consciousness is, to me, coherence. 
or coherence is a sign of consciousness. There, there's, there's a relationship, a strong relationship between coherence and consciousness. And we'll get into that more in terms of the brain and frequencies, electrical energies, and the, the movement in the body, movements in the body, cycles in the body, and the coherence that relates to conscious state. But this, the equality is interesting in those five things of the quintessence, and it, I see it as a, a consciousness, you know, it's the, 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 the source consciousness, God consciousness, creator consciousness, in this cycle of five that's self-regulating, that there's no, there's no reason in our, in our particular understanding of physics why those five things should have balance and harmony, and yet there's a balance and harmony that shows up. How? It's not in the amount of energy, it's in a linear measurement of each. There's about the same length of each of those. And we, uh, to even think about what that means, to me, the, the main thing that comes to mind is if we look at the essential shape of the universe, as we've talked about, as a dodecahedron, well, each of those faces has five lines of equal length. So if each of these five things of the quintessence, just like the five elements of, of oriental medicine, as a, a wonderful reflection, the model of that, if they're about equal, you have harmony and balance in that, that the co-cycle, the, the cycle of the energies flowing through those five elements. And, and that, we see that in the body, in health. There's a balance, there's a harmony. They're about equal. Like the energies through the meridians of the five different elements are gonna all be about equal if the body's really in a harmonic state. And that's a state where because the energies are equal, the consciousness, the dark matter, dark energy, the part that we can't measure and see, but we experience, we can feel, we can experience, it is the, the, the ground of experience, that, that that's gonna be able to flow smoothly between those, and in fact expand, the, the dark energy function is expansive, the dark matter function is to be centered and connected non-locally to be here and somewhere else, or some other time. It's what carries those, those stargates or wormholes, as they call it physics, uh, to another place or time uh, on a macroscopic level of human experience. So, so there's this, this linear harmonic balancing within three orders of magnitude out of 60 on each of these in the entire universe to the best we can measure. We can't measure them that precisely, so that's pretty darn good. That's like, geometrically, that's like 5% in terms of orders of magnitude. Uh, and again, no reason in fundamentally in physics that that should be the case, so it's another sort of truth that, that the universe is teaching us that there is this relationship between the amount of light and the amount of electricity and the amount of material substance and the amount of spiritual substance and the amount of spiritual energy of growth. So bringing it into the human experience now from the cosmos, um, we, we have the, the, the cycle of the five elements that we talked about last time in terms of spiritual development. So we're going to relate that, that we breathe in the spirit minerals that are in the air. We take them to the heart from the lungs, so from the metal element to the, to, and we're gonna go in a cycle here, mm -hmm. from the lung, which is metal element, to the, the heart, which has the highest electrical field of the body, and, and therefore it, it, it brings, it electrically brings that spirit mineral within the field of the body. We breathe it in and it's, it's in the earth's field. It's part of the earth cell right, of consciousness and it comes into us. Now we're part of that earth cell of consciousness, but now it's particularly ours. It's gonna wanna stay within, it's gonna function within our realm. It becomes part of our spirit body. And so from the heart, it goes to the, the earth element, digestion, spleen and pancreas and stomach, they're all down over here. So we're moving in the cycle of consciousness in the, in the body in the five elements. And, and uh, so that's where we have, we've gone from sensation on, on a consciousness level, the, a, a model that our sensorium are, are taking in the world, like we're taking in the breath, we're also taking in sight, sound, all these vibrations, whether it's 
sound vibration of the movement of atoms of the material substance, whether it's electromagnetic vibration of photons coming in through the eyes. We're taking that, these waveforms in as energy. They come to the surface of our cellular, our organismic cellular level structure, and we transform them uh, into, into self, into our own experience as like a holographic projection, holographic uh, interpretation of what's out there. So we project it out there, we see it out there because it's coming to us here. And in physics, this is one of the leading understandings and models of how it is that the universe works. It appears to be that it could be holographic, that even this three-dimensional space may be a projection of a two-dimensional hologram. Or if it's a 10-dimensional space, it could be a projection of some lower dimensional surface. Uh, on a cellular level, I have reason to believe that the consciousness resides in the cell membrane. Just like on an organism level, our senses are mostly on the surface. We have specialized receptors like the uh, ears and the eyes, taste and smell and touch. It's all on the surface. And on the surface of the cell, the cell membrane has special receptors. They're proteins that have little antennas that stick out from the cell. They'll be like our eyes of the cell or our ears of the cell. Kind of like a moth has those antennas that are, and they can detect all kinds of frequencies with those. But the detector is not the experience. The detector receives the energy. It, it transforms the energy from one form to another. Like the eye transforms the light energy into an electrical signal. But people who've had, like in World War II, there was a case where a bullet went through this man's skull severed both optic nerves. He was completely blind. And so we understand that the sensation of vision, his eyes were perfectly healthy. The eyes were normal, functioning normally. They could change that light into an electrical signal. They could transduce the energy, transform it. But he couldn't see. Why? Because our vision doesn't happen until the signal gets to the visual cortex, which is way back here. So that's our, our sensorium is like the cell membrane of the cell. The cell membrane of the brain is the cortex. Why do humans have all these infoldings of the cortex to make more surface areas like a bigger cell, but fit in this small head, <laughs> somewhat small head? So, so we have more consciousness because there's more surface area, more space for it. At a cell level, we know, for example, that anesthetics, what do they do? Anesthetics block consciousness. They stop the consciousness. They don't take away the cause of the pain. They don't take away the damage. They take away the awareness of pain or awareness of other sensation. And we know that the stronger an anesthetic is, the more it likes to concentrate in the fat-soluble uh, cell membrane versus in the, they have to have some solubility in both in order to get into the body. But the more they concentrate, the more they like that fat-soluble layer in the cell membrane, the more they effectively block consciousness. So, and it's a very clear line in, in neurology, in, uh, in uh, uh, anesthesiology. So uh, fascinating. And, and what are they? They're compounds that have a lot of fluorine and chlorine. You know, these are toxins. These are irritants. Wow. So they interfere, those minerals interfere with the function of whatever the minerals of consciousness are, which we think are the dark matter minerals of the transition elements in a high spin state where they, they don't interact much with, with heat. They're not, not thermally coupled, coupled with their environment. It's like, uh, so, so we have the, the cell membrane being the location of consciousness. Well, where's, what about memory? Something, some energy that came into that receptor and was transduced and came in and we became conscious of it and we attach some sort of significance to it, it has some meaning, there's some association with it, and somehow that's stored. Where's that stored? There's one model of memory that works for me, that I plug it into my model, and that says the Penrose Hammerhoff model, these are neuroscientists, that say, we think it's in the microtubules. Fascinating, the microtubules are these little tubes filled with water, the protein, they're attached right into the cell membrane, so a nice convenient space to store something that's mm -hmm. not going to get disturbed because inside this protein sheath. And uh, it's the only model of memory that suggests 
a location, a specific, explicit location for memory that provides enough data points for the experience of how much memory we can have in human life. Fascinating. What happens in near-death experience when people have this sudden download? Now you're talking about memory just in the cells in the brain? Or in, in, every in, cell. in every cell. In every cell. The, the brain has a specialized function, certainly, and, and, and our sensorium we experience largely in the brain, even like touch. Uh, we, ex we, we feel it as though it's here, we see it as though it's there. There's this holographic experience that's projected into real space. And, and the more veridically or truthfully it's projected, the more effective it is. So there, there's this idea in science currently that, that suggests, well, we can't trust our senses. So we can't. We can't rely on sensory experience or human experience for anything. If that were true, science wouldn't exist. You know, it, what's really true is that our senses have evolved to be truthful, or else they wouldn't be, they wouldn't keep us alive. They wouldn't be, uh, uh, they wouldn't have, you know, an advantage in genetic selection if they weren't veridical. So, so our senses, we actually can rely on, and we can certainly improve on them when they're not reliable. There are issues with senses, you know, and, and vision. We can see double, and that's not so good. And a child who sees double may, you know, say in an eye exam, well, well uh, why, didn't, you know, why didn't you tell your parents that you were seeing double or your teacher? Well, because I thought everybody saw that way. That's, that's normal. That's how I see. I don't have anybody else's vision to compare to. And, and how do you know which one to, to, to interact with? Well, the real one. That's the real one, and that one's the fake one, and then just ignore it. Or we can suppress, we can stop seeing it. We can, which is an active process that takes energy. We can shut off that image uh, from, from the other eye. So it's, that's a whole fascinating story of how we can make our senses more veridical, but the truth is our senses work quite well. If we cut off a limb, we may have still projecting pain, phantom limb pain, and phantom sensations into the location where that limb is supposed to be, that we anticipate it to be, even though it's gone. So yeah, the, the, the brain has a special, a special function in terms of, I think we can, we can model it as being the, the actual consciousness, but yet there's, there's the subconscious. And every cell has a subconscious consciousness, a consciousness of its own. Just like we've said, uh, a, a mineral has a consciousness of its own. It's not human consciousness. It's not our sense of awareness as an organism, but the sense of awareness that a cell has is important to the cell, whether it's a brain cell or some other cell. And we also remember we've talked about the cosmos and the structure of it. The grand structure of the cosmos is structured exactly like our brain cells. So there's, there's a neurological consciousness supporting structure that we see in the cosmos. So it's not just human, it's at every level. Uh, we see that in fungi too. They're literally the consciousness in the soil that connects the plants and decides which tree will get enough nutrients to live when there's not enough for everyone. There's fascinating stories on, on that level. Uh, so, okay, so we were at the